Um, and just, just to let you guys know, and maybe to, to give you a little bit of motivation, I didn't know anything about machine learning coming into my PhD. It's something I'd sort of learned during this time. Um, so it's definitely never too late to start. And if you just kind of keep using it and practicing and trying it, uh, you will learn a lot, especially the place like the MNI, uh, where there's a, a lot of really, really amazing people uh, doing this kind of work. <clears throat> so, um, I, so just a few things before we get started. Um, I, I can see uh, the Zoom group chat okay. So if you have questions, uh, I should be able to see it on the chat. If they're kind of like um, issues, maybe the TAs or, or small questions, maybe the TAs can cover it. But, um, but you can feel free to, to type your questions into the chat and I should be able to see them. Or if you really want to like say your question, which we haven't done in the past, but um, that, that, that's okay too. I'm just, uh, but uh, just say that you want, you have a question, and, and then I'll, we can unmute you or whatever. But I, I have a question before we get started, um, which is, I, I wanted to create a poll, but I, I couldn't for some reason. So, um, in the part, if you open the participants uh, thing, you can see that uh, you have some uh, options to say yes or no, and and other things. I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm just curious. Um, if, if you have used fMRI data or, or you understand what fMRI data is measuring, can you hit uh, the yes kind of like this? You can see next to me in the participants, I have like a little check mark. Okay, it's working. We've got, okay, great. And if, if, you, if, you, if you don't know what fMRI measures and you've never used fMRI, you can hit no, uh, the X for no. We also have some thumbs up and thumbs down. That works too. Okay. So we've got about 40, 40, about 40 people have answered. So that's most of you. So it looks like most of you have had experience um, with those uh, measures. So that's great. So I won't spend that much time talking about them, but I will cover a little bit of, uh, of the basics um, at some point for those of you that have not. Okay, anyway, so, whoops, no, I definitely want to be yes. Okay, so let's get started. So, so um, the, the purpose of this workshop here is to really build off what you just learned with the Stephanie, but apply it into uh, not only a practical context, but also a neuroimaging and uh, neuroscience context. So, you know, it's really important to know the basics. This is something that, um, you know, JB has taught us and is very important. You really, it's really important to know what you're doing before you go in, because as you're going to find out, SKLearn and NILEARN make machine learning very easy. So it's very easy to go in there really not know what you're what you're doing and build models and do machine learning um, and that's kind of the purpose of of, of sk learn and nylearn is to make these things easy but that's why it's so important that we had that lecture from stephanie and that we continue to to teach ourselves um, so that we go in there with some sense of what we're doing and we don't make uh, mistakes that have been very very common uh, commonly made over time so what we're going to do here is we're going to use this uh, python package called nylearn uh, to, to extract data from some uh, resting state uh, fMRI images. We're then going to use that data to build a machine learning model to predict age, and we're gonna do that using sklearn. Uh, so we're gonna try to predict age using fMRI data. Um, and what we're really gonna try to do as well is integrate uh, some of the lessons that Stephanie taught us in her lecture and try to uh, give um, practical examples of, of what happens when you do and, and don't do that. So um, I'll, I'll, I've also, I'm going to be using um, this really cool RISE software that Ross introduced us to. So we'll see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> I am not a superhuman like Ross and Elizabeth, so I, I cannot type while teaching. Uh, I can't multitask very well. So, so all of your um, Python code is going to be already there inside of your cells, but um, that's good. You will have to spend less time making sure you're not making typos. You can spend more time focusing on the concepts. And I'll try to um, sort of introduce everything that I'm doing in each of these lines. And you can always make a new cell above and sort of type your own stuff and see what it's doing. Sometimes I'll do that as well. Uh, but I would like you to follow along with me and, and type along when I run a cell like this one. You can also run that cell uh, with me. And then uh, so you'll be able to follow along. So as you've learned from Pear's tutorial earlier and some of the earlier tutorials in the week, this just makes it so when we generate a plot, it will, it will automatically show inside of our Jupyter Notebook. So before we really to, to, to get to do the machine learning, we actually have to get our data. And this can be a little bit challenging sometimes because neuroimaging data is large and sometimes unwieldy. Um, 
uh, you know, fMRI, we have not only a single image, but we have multiple images. We have a stack of three-dimensional images. That is a lot of data. So it's tricky to get it into from that 4D, four-dimensional format to this two-dimensional format where we just have features along with samples. Um, so that's the first thing we're going to do here. So um, <clears throat> you should have already done this, and here's where, here's where we're going to figure out if you did or not. Um, this cell, if you run it, what it should do is it should hopefully if you've already ran it, it should find uh, the data that you downloaded earlier and it should load it um, into this uh, variable called data. If you did not do this earlier or if you, um, you know, didn't uh, did change the defaults, you might see a download start. And that would be bad news for you because this is a lot of data and it would probably take a long time to download. Um, that's okay uh, if that's the case. If this isn't working for you, um, there is a part later in the tutorial where we have already generated the data and you can load it without having to um, re-download this data set. But uh, until that time, you'll just have to kind of uh, watch and see what's going on. But hopefully this should have just done basically nothing, just like it did for me. And uh, afterwards, you will have a variable called data, um, which will have a couple of different um, attributes to it, including confounds, func, phenotypic, and so forth. So we'll go through what some of that stuff is. Um, so the first question is how many individuals do we have? And we can figure that out by looking inside of um, basically func, which is where the functional uh, scans live. Well, not the scans themselves, but the paths to the scans. We'll go, th we'll go through that in a second. But here we're looking at the length of this list of, of paths, and we see that there are 155. So there's a, we have 155 images uh, four-dimensional fMRI images that we have downloaded. So that's how many subjects we've got. Um, and so what we're going to do with that fMRI data is we're going to basically do a machine learning pipeline. So this is taken from a resource that I think I've linked to there on the Jupyter Notebook, um, which is just a really uh, elegant demonstration of how this works. We've got our, our resting state fMRI data. And <clears throat> what the fMRI data is measuring is what's called the bold signal. This is the blood oxygen dependent uh, level dependent signal. And in a nutshell, you're really measuring where blood is going, uh, where blood flow is going in the brain over time. Um, okay, we have someone who's downloaded, okay, someone who's downloaded the data, the thought was the data, um, started downloading the data. Okay, well that, I expected that would happen. Um, maybe some of the TAs can help you for the time being, but later on we'll be able to uh, <clears throat> get, oh, there's some data available on the Git repository that you can just load. So for now, sit tight. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so what the bold signal is measuring is um, how blood flow is changing in the brain over time. So uh, when we're talking about functional connectivity, we're thinking about uh, regions that where blood flow flows into or out of those regions at the same time. Uh, we don't know if that means that the regions are, are activated or inactivated or anything like that, but we know that those regions are taking more resources. And, and we are assuming if they are taking more, when, when two regions are taking resources at the same time that are uh, sort of uh, spatially distributed, we're, we're assuming that we're, we're calling them functionally connected. And we're just saying that the blood flow in those regions is changing uh, at the, kind of in the same pattern over time. So that's what functional cognitivity is measuring. So we're going to see if these, uh, I guess we have this hypothesis that uh, functional cognitivity should, at rest should change over the course of age. And if that's true, then we should be able to measure functional cognitivity, put it into a machine learning model, and, and try to predict someone's age just by their pattern of functional cognitivity. Um, and once again, I'll reiterate just one more time that um, for the people that are doing the data download, if you just sit tight for a bit, um, we'll, after the sort of data extraction part, which you should pay attention to just so you can see how to do it in the future, uh, we'll be able to load some data that's already on your Git repo that has already been extracted. Um, so, right, so what we need to do is we want to, first we have to define which regions we're going to be um, measuring the connectivity from, right? Do we want big regions, giant networks? Do we want just small individual regions of interest? Um, and then once we have those regions, um, we will compute a correlation matrix so we can see how the functional activity or blood flow is changing over time in these different regions and how that these blood flow changes are correlated with one, and one another. So we'll practice this just on one individual subject first. 
Uh, and then after that, we'll extract the data from all of the subjects. And as you see with Nylearn, it makes things very easy. First step is retrieving the brain atlas for extracting the features. Um, and so we'll do this for an example subject. So um, <clears throat> since there's many, many different atlases out there, um, a brain atlas is really just a predefined uh, three-dimensional map of different brain regions that can be defined based on um, anatomy, it can be defined based on histology, or it can be defined uh, sort of in data-driven fashion um, on your own data or other people have used massive amounts of data and great techniques in order to um, sort of define regions that are, um, you know, segregate themselves based on certain uh, measured parameters, such as resting state functional cognitivity. So here we'll use the MIST atlas, which was officially published by uh, one of our T TAs, uh, Sebastian Erx, who is in Pierre Belek's lab in 2019. Um, and this is a really cool atlas that was created using functional connectivity data. So the regions that are generated are regions that seem to show similar functional more similar functional connectivity to each other than to other parts of the brain. And this is a very useful atlas because it actually comes in several resolutions or scales. You can have really large networks of just seven regions, or you can have very, very fine grained regions uh, up to 444. We'll, we'll go somewhere in the middle and use a 64 region atlas. So Nylearn is really great because it has all of these different data sets. Earlier, I had you uh, import uh, from Nylearn import data sets. And if you look at data sets um, and you do dot tab, uh, it'll show you all the different options. And inside of this uh, data sets sort of um, sub library here, you can see there are many different commands and functions to fetch different atlases, as well as different data sets that includes some um, task based functional data sets. This one we're using here, which is a resting state uh, functional data set. There are also some um, uh, volumetric uh, structural MRI data sets. So there's lots of different data sets in here for you to play, a lot, play around with and practice your machine learning chops um, that are immediately available. So that's extremely helpful. But as I said before, there are also some atlases in there, including uh, the MIST atlas, which is called uh, BASC right now. Um, <clears throat> so here we are asking Nylearn to fetch this atlas. Um, so go ahead and run it because it's going to download, but this is a small file, so it shouldn't take very long to download. And uh, once it does, we're going to ask to, um, there, as I mentioned before, there are several resolutions and we're going to ask for scale 64. Um, so we have 64 regions. So, uh, so for some of you that's downloading, um, but the, the, the cool thing to note is that when I save parcellations scale 64 to a variable, here I'm printing it, notice that this is not an image. It's, a, it's just a path. This is a path to an image that is living on your hard disk. So this tells you exactly where um, the uh, <clears throat> atlas got downloaded to. And um, it's important to know that it's, it, this is really just string that's indicating a path. Nylon does this because as I mentioned before, um, a lot of these neural images are huge. They're very large uh, pieces of data. And if you're loading lots of them, it can really slow down uh, your computer because you're using a lot of memory. So what Nylon does, which is very helpful, is it will do a lot of that um, data input and output automatically for you so you don't have to keep your images um, sort of in, <clears throat> in memory. So we'll see an example of that below to actually look at the atlas. Another thing that's really, really helpful about Nylearn uh, is its plotting function, which we'll use. And this is something that even when I'm not using machine learning, I use it all the time. When I wanted to look at an atlas uh, or an image before, I had to kind of like you know, minimize my Python window, go open my image viewer and, and, and look at it there. But with Nylearn, you can actually just plot, um, plot the images directly into your notebook as I'm going to do here. Now, I'm doing this on my computer, so it's slow. Um, but basically what this is doing is it's loading the atlas, because remember, we only passed the path. So it's loading the atlas and then it's displaying it right here in your notebook. Uh, which is extremely helpful. So now we can see the atlas that we're going to be using for functional connectivity. Um, so you can see that each one of these little um, regions is a brain region that uh, has <clears throat> more similar functional connectivity within than uh, outside of it. And what we'll be doing is looking at the functional time series, correlating the functional time series between, for example, this region and every other region. Um, so now that we have our atlas, the next thing we want to do is load our four-dimensional fMRI time series. So once again, um, as I mentioned before, 
the paths to the data lives here in data.func. And if I print that, you can see that there's just, it's just a list of paths. So same thing here. These are not images, they're just paths. And if I wanna just take the first one, then we have, as I'm doing here, then we have the path to just the first image in that list. Um, here I'm printing it and you can see this is where it lives on my hard disk. So we'll have a look at the image, um, but this is a little tricky. We, we, we can't look at, um, the image is four dimensional, so we can't look at it all at once. We'll have to look at just one slice, or if we want, we can look at an average image. Um, so uh, Nylon has a really helpful function here um, called mean image, where you can pass it several images, which I'm passing in the fmi file names. These are just paths to images, and it will produce an average version of those images. And I'm gonna plot that image so we can see it here. Okay, so here is the uh, fMRI image. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I can't read Nylon, but I have it installed. Uh, I'll have to let the TAs take, uh, take that one on, maybe here or in Slack. Okay, so for those of you for this is working, so here you see we've generated, uh, uh, we have plotted our um, average image. So this is uh, for our first subject, we have taken all of the one, uh, all of the different uh, time frames um, in the time series, and we have averaged them, and that's what we're seeing here. So um, this is before. Um, let's say we want to look at a different different cross section of this. We're saying, oh, you know, x equals zero. We're getting this weird sinus here. Maybe I want uh, different cut points. So you can see. Uh, by the way, if you want to look at uh, different um, arguments inside of a function, you can hold shift tab. I often do that to remind myself what are the different arguments. You can see there's one here called cut coords. So I'm going to use cut coords and I'll pass it the X, Y, and Z that I want. We can change X, so let's change it to 10, but we'll leave Y the same and Z the same, right? I'm getting those coordinates here. And you can see when I do that, it will plot um, a different cross section. But more recently, there's actually a much more useful um, function called view image. And this one really blew me away when I saw it. Um, I'm gonna take my uh, average image and put it into this view image function that comes with neither and dot plotting. And now this is actually an interactive plot inside of your Jupyter notebook. So now you can actually navigate through the brain yourself um, and uh, which is uh, extremely useful, as you can see. Again, you don't have to shut down Python at all. You can just navigate through what's going on here. This is really cool. Um, for those of you that haven't seen an fMRI image before, is there anything that uh, seems a bit strange to you about these images? You, if so, you can just write it in the chat. Anything that seems a bit, I don't know, unusual? The color, well, the color map, well, yeah, the color map is, it's all, all the images are, 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 are positive. Um, so yeah, this is, so this is just in scientific notation. This means that the, the counts go up to about a thousand. Um, you, can, you can always change that with various uh, inputs into, the, um, into this function. And I encourage you to try to just mess around with some of these different inputs here. Um, the count of what the count? Uh, I guess bold. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, is it adjusted to the perception of the human eye? Yes, there is some adjustment that happens. Uh, automatic scaling of the data uh, when you when you um, plot this, but you can you can of course change that with uh, let's see threshold for example. So I can set a threshold of I don't know two thousand. I'm not sure. I have no idea what this is going to do. Yeah, that's gone. Okay, that, maybe that wasn't a good threshold. Um, but you can, I think there's also like a V min, maybe V max, V min. Uh, okay, so positive blood oxygen, what does that refer to? I do extracellular electrophysiology. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so what is the exact count? I guess uh, I, I'm not an MR physicist. I probably should know this. But um, I guess what we're counting is the uh, when we are uh, when the magnet does its gyration thing, it will cause the atoms to um, 
reverse their spin for a second, which creates some sort of signal that's being detected by the scanner. That's my best answer for you for that. Um, but we should probably get, I can probably answer that better at the end. Can you really describe time series in relation to fMRI? Yes, I will describe that a little bit later. We'll actually plot the time series so you can see it. Uh, I had a question about the average image. What exactly is average? So basically, um, if I load the fMRI data, it's actually multiple time frames. So what we're seeing here is just the average image, um, and that's one image. But if I were to say um, view image, let's say fMRI file names zero, image file error, and I can't scroll down, great. Um, oh, no, right, because it's because it's zipped, of course. Right, and that's not going to let me because it's two-dimensional, right? So, yeah, that's not a good uh, showcase of that. But basically, there are several images that are being taken over time. So usually, uh, maybe over one second, over two seconds, depending on the scanner, sometimes it can be less than a second. You will, uh, you are basically measuring the blood flow at that second, at another second, at another second, and so forth. And you're, and you're seeing how the bold signal is changing over the over time. So when I average all of those images, you're just getting um, essentially an an averaged image, which isn't helpful from an fMRI standpoint. I just wanted to sort of visualize the data and mostly to show you guys the fact that there's kind of data missing in a lot of places, like the cerebellum is not really here, the bottom of the temporal lobe isn't here, um, and this is very and um, there's some data that maybe got um, put here that isn't actually there because of distortion. Um, and the idea here is just to see that there is distortion with these fMRI images, so we have to kind of be careful about how we're interpreting what's going on. Um, so I'm going to move on uh, just so we can get to the main part of this, which is you know machine learning. Um, but we will come, we can come back to this if we have questions. Uh, okay, so we have our parcellation, we have our image. So how do we get? Um, no, the data was pre-processed. Um, so, uh, okay, so the question is how do we sort of get to that two-dimensional image that I showed you before? We are still sort of in a four-dimensional space and we need to get our, our um, data into a sort of samples by features matrix. So we have this um, sort of uh, this function called nifty labels masker, which really does just that. Um, and this is an immensely helpful function. I used to do this by hand, which was fine, but this works much faster. And the way it works is that it's, it's really designed to do exactly what we want. It's designed to take some data, um, some four-dimensional data, take an atlas, and extract the data from each of the labels in the atlas um, for each of the different volumes in the time series. So it really does exactly what we want. Um, so here I'm going to introduce this concept that you've actually seen before, but it's really important for sklearn and nylearn, um, and it's a very unique part of their API which is basically that um, rather than simply calling functions all the time, like, you know, sklearn dot fit this model, instead what happens is you create uh, model objects. And these model objects um, are sort of classes that first you, you initialize them with some parameters that are important that it will use later. And then you then use that model object later on to fit or to predict or to transform and so forth. And you'll see a little bit later why this is so important and uh, so dynamic, but it's a little bit different. Um, so in this case, we have this nifty labels masker object, and we're going to pass it just a few parameters. Um, we're passing it the atlas that we loaded earlier, which is now, this is just a path to that atlas. We're telling it to standardize the data. And other than that, this is just some basic stuff about how um, it's using memory and outputting. But importantly, by just running this, nothing will happen. All that happens is that this object gets initialized. Then, once that object is initialized we, into this uh, variable masker, uh, we can then use the function that it gains, which is called fit transform. So we sort of take this model and we fit it, or this object, and we fit it to the fMRI four-dimensional data. Um, so that's what's going to happen. And the other thing that 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 this will do is while it um, does the data extraction, it will also regress out confounds. We'll talk a little bit about what confounds are in a second. For those of you familiar with fMRI data, that should be obvious. Um, and it should be also really helpful to see that the confounds get regressed out automatically. 
Um, so I'll come back to the confounds in a second. For now, let's just sort of run this, um, this function, which once again, will take, use the atlas, uh, fit it to the fMRI data, and extract it into the time series that we're looking for. Okay, so that was relatively fast. So what do we just create here? So what is this variable? How would this time series? Number from I have a low temporal resolution. Yeah, so it definitely has a much lower temporal resolution. Um, of as I said, the TR is anywhere from two seconds to sub millisecond sometimes, but way slower than EF is. Um, so I guess you'll actually see that right here. So the time series object we just created um, is a um, NumPy ND array. So we're familiar with that. Uh, its shape is 168 by 64. So Maybe to help illustrate this, does anyone have an idea what these two um, numbers represent, right? This matrix we've just created, it's a 168 by 64. What are, what are these two uh, numbers? Anyone have a guess for either of them? Yes, exactly. Yeah, you guys got it. We've got uh, 64 regions of interest, right? We have the 64 regions. And we have 168 volumes or time points, right? So for each of those time points, we've extracted the, the, the fMRI data. So basically, this is essentially 64 time series, one for each region. Uh, that's measuring how the blood flow is changing over time. And as I said, the TR being about, you know, I think for this data set, it's two seconds. So um, we're talking about something like this much this many seconds of, of um, data, basically, which I guess if you want to know in, in minutes, about five and a half minutes of, of data that's being collected here over that 168 time point. So much, much slower than EFIS. Okay, um, we'll get back to time series in a second. Now to talk very briefly about the confounds. Um, so this uh, data was, mo most pre-processing pipelines will uh, give you some sort of um, uh, data frame or spreadsheet that has the confound information. So um, we have this variable called conf, I guess, or I guess uh, the confounds live in uh, data.confounds. And again, you see there's a list of this confound regressors.tsv. Uh, so there's these TSVs, one for each subject. You can see that it's named per subject and it's in the same order as the subjects are, which is helpful for us. So I've taken the first one and I've called it um, conf. So it's pointing just to this uh, TSV. We're gonna load it with pandas, making sure that we um, use uh, tab as the delimiter and we'll have a look. My computer is very old, so it's gonna take it quite a long time to load pandas. Um, but here we go, uh, here's the CSV that's inside. And you can see that for each one of these spreadsheets, you will have uh, columns which indicate what the confound is and you have values for each of the time series, or for each of the um, volumes in the time series. So you can see some of the stuff here includes, for example, the average white matter signal, average CSF signal. Over here, you have some uh, motion parameters that just tell you how much the head has moved in terms of its rotation and translation um, kind of over, over time so you can regress out the effects of motion. And that's what we did before. And uh, if you look at the shape of this, once again, you have 15 compounds and one uh, for each time, uh, time point in the time series. So that data is then regressed out of the time series. And so we have done some steps to reduce the degree to which motion is affecting our resting state fMRI image. So now let's compute the correlation matrix. We have the time series. We have 64 different time series. Now we're interested how these, uh, the time series are correlated with one another so we can get a sense of this functional connectivity. Once again, Nylern makes this very easy for us. There are actually many other ways to do this, but we're gonna stick to the Nylern way. Uh, and once again, just like before, it's gonna start by initializing uh, a connectivity object. So um, I'm just gonna run this really quick, just so you can see um, that you can mess around a little bit with this connectivity measure. It doesn't just have to be um, correlation. You can see that uh, it has some different kinds. You can do a, a uh, covariance matrix, you can do partial correlation. There's a lot of different options here, but uh, it's very useful to use this metric 
um, this function because you can invert it or do the inverse transformation a little bit later. Um, oh, this is so annoying. Anyway, don't worry about that. Going back to the code. So we're basically initializing this object, connectivity measure. It's, a it's going to create, basically create a correlation matrix. And then once we've initialized it, we'll once again use this fit transform function on our time series. Um, and the reason I'm taking the first index here is because this uh, correlation measure can actually take uh, several images. So, so you can pass it several different time series and um, doctors are calling. You take several different time series and, um, and it, it will do this for all of them. So we're just gonna take the first index because we only have one time series we're passing. And you can see it is now a 64 by 64 matrix, which I guess you've all figured out by now is the correlation of time series uh, from every region to every other region. And we can also display that uh, by plotting it. One thing that, so I'm actually gonna um, comment this line out for a second. Uh, I'll, I'll plot the matrix here. And I'll just plot it so I can talk, uh, so you can see it as I'm going through it. So here you can see the correlation matrix. It's every uh, region correlated to every other region. The heat map is telling you uh, basically the R value, so the degree of correlation. So deeper red color is um, more highly correlated regions. Blue is negatively correlated and so forth. You can see we can pass all sorts of different um, kind of uh, arguments to this function, including um, you know, what to put as the labels for the axes, how big to make the figure, um, how I can set the uh, color bar and so forth. So it's a very nice little, little function. Um, but we have this annoying thing where, of course, every region is uh, fully correlated with itself, right? Every time series is gonna be uh, correlated with itself. So um, in order to get rid of that, we're just gonna use this NumPy fill diagonal. We're gonna pass the correlation matrix to it. And we're gonna say, basically make every item in, that, in the diagonal into a zero. And if we do that, you can see that it worked. And we, now we don't have that annoying diagonal in the middle. Yes, this is still for one participant. Um, so that's what's really cool about four dimensional data. This is not looking at the correlation between participants. This is looking at correlation across time. So, you know, if this, uh, this really high correlation here, I have to look really close to see what those numbers are. Um, but basically region 44 and region four have a really high correlation of their time series over time, which basically indicates that the blood flow uh, the blood flow dynamics are, are quite similar over time in these two regions. Therefore, they are functionally connected. Um, so this is just for one participant. And for, for basically our object next is to load, uh, is to basically initialize this um, correlation matrix for every subject and use that for our machine learning model, hoping that it's a very rich uh, sort of uh, source of data with which to make predictions. Um, Okay, so this is great. So we're going to now extract features from the whole data set, and that will give us a, a natural break um, to answer some questions. And um, what was the processing pipeline used on this data? So it was, I, so um, I, you can actually look at the Nylearn documentation, uh, which will give you links to the data set, which is on Open Neuro, which has all the information on how it was processed. It was processed using fMRI prep, which is very standard and very excellent uh, fMRI uh, processing pipeline. So I encourage you to, to go check out the documentation. You can learn everything you need to. Um, yeah, okay, so we're gonna ex extract um, the data for everybody and while it's extracting, we can answer some more questions and, and take a breather. So we're gonna use a simple loop. I know you guys know loops, you've been introduced to them. I'm gonna do a quick reintroduction here. This is a very simple uh, for loop here. Basically, we want to do the exact same thing um, several times, but changing just one variable, which here is i. So we want to print the number is, but have i change from zero to nine. So we run that loop and it does exactly what we expect. Each time i changes, and then um, we can see the output that I'm printing. Um, we also, if we want to store that information, there's many ways to do that. Um, but one of them is to use a container. So what we're gonna do in this loop is for every round uh, in this for loop, we are going to, um, append i, so this variable, to this empty list. And so the list will grow over time to encapsulate every variable that we created inside of this loop. And if I run this, you can see that container then contains um, all of the variables we created. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're actually going to do uh, 
some sort of pre-processing of this data to get it, it get these connectivity matrices and then at the end of the, the each iteration of the loop we're going to just stick it into a container so we can use it for later so it's pretty simple um, so before we do that we're just going to reinitialize everything and do some things that we don't need to do in the loop we only need to do these things once so no reason to do them uh, multiple times in the for loop so that includes just basically what we've already done i'm just going to reload the atlas reinitialize the masker um, reinitialize the correlation measure. So uh, pretty straightforward. That should happen instantly. Um, and now we're going to run our big for loop. So on my laptop, this takes a few minutes. It should take a few minutes on yours. So that's totally fine. I want you to do it. Um, again, if you have it, if you don't, I promise right after this section, uh, you can load some data uh, that's already been, we've already, that's uh, after we've already done this. Um, so you can see this is a lot of very complicated operations before Nylearn, this would be a lot more code than four lines, okay? But here, all we're doing is we're making this container. We're gonna iterate through uh, the, uh, the different um, paths to, to our fMRI images. And we're gonna do three things. We're gonna run our time series data. Uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna extract the time series from the data using uh, masker fit.transform. This is our nifty labels masker. We're gonna compute the correlation matrix. And then we're just gonna append that matrix to this list. So all of that is gonna be done um, in just three lines, which is why Nylearn is a really fantastic tool for getting things uh, ready for your, uh, for your machine learning models when you're working with neuroimaging data. So why don't you go ahead and run that? Um, so now we're, I told it to, to give us a little bit of feedback as to how many it's finished. Um, so you, you guys should see the same thing. Hopefully yours is going a lot faster than mine. Um, yes, it is a list of matrices. So um, yeah, you're gonna have, uh, cause at the end the correlation matrix is what we're generating. And so there's gonna be hopefully at the end 155 correlation matrices. So while this is running, we can have some time to answer questions. Before. So after this, we're gonna go with the machine learning. So you can either, if you have questions, you can ask them to me now. Otherwise just take like two minutes to like breathe, stretch, uh, stand up, relax, and then after this, we're gonna go into a bit more machine learning. Uh, but yeah, if you've got questions so far, please, now's a good time. Why a list and not a data frame? Uh, you know, if, uh, well, I don't know. If you, so yes, you could just make the data, a data frame out of this information uh, easily. There's uh, many, many ways to, um, to do this. I chose a list for two reasons. One, it's really simple to explain. Uh, the second reason is, um, keeping them as NumPy objects will allow us a bit more efficiency. Um, there's, uh, Pandas data frames can be a bit heavier um, and we don't really need uh, labels necessarily at this time. So we're keeping them in their NumPy uh, array format and then we can just stick them into lists and they're very easy to concatenate once you have lists. Um, so, but that, that, there's no definitive way of doing this there. If you want to concatenate these correlation matrices in another way, that's totally fine. This is just one of many ways to do this. Any other questions? Alrighty. Um, let's just, oh, uh, just curious. My data is multi-level data frames. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. Um, that would, that's a particular use case. Um, that's a particular use case, and for that, you would have to maybe make some adjustments to the code, but it's no problem at all. Data frames are just fine. Um, why is it called fit transform? Great question. Um, you are basically doing two things at once. You are fitting this data, and then you are using it to transform some other data. So you're, when you fit the masker, it basically, in a sense, initializes, again, this masker object to uh, include all the parameters that you had set before. And you can do masker.fit alone without the transform part. Maybe if you want to not do the transformation and save that for later. <sighs> Excuse me. Uh, the transformation comes when you actually apply this masker to the, um, to the time series, which is a separate step. How does the functional connectivity changes with age? Shouldn't a thing like cortical thickness be better feature for that? I don't know, maybe it is. Maybe cortical thickness is better uh, maybe it's not, uh, we don't, that would be like a great thing for you to maybe do for your project. If you were interested in learning more about machine learning, you could take a data set that has both functional data and structural data, do machine learning pipelines with them separately or maybe mixed, see if one is better or if they have complementary information. Um, 
Yeah, it could be an interesting question. I, I have my own thoughts about that, but we don't have to get into that. Um, yes, I would, I, would, I would agree with Daniel on, on here. <clears throat> All right, so I think we can, we can get moving into the next part. Um, Right, okay, so we can now save this data to disk. Now we, we just spent two or three minutes waiting for that data to generate. If we have to restart our kernel, it would be a shame to lose all that. So we can save the data if we want to. Now, I would like to caution you, if you did not complete the previous cell, if you, um, if you saw an error or it just didn't finish in time, do not uncomment this line. And especially, yeah, so, so if, if everything finished, you can go ahead if you want to and uncomment this line and, um, uh, and it actually will save the data. Um, so it will save it to a really easy to uh, store and a low uh, memory format and also very easy to load. And that's, that's just a very useful feature. But do not uncomment or run that if you have not completed this. Um, right, so, right, so for all of you, this is really important, for all of you who were not able to get this to work, um, who could who basically were still downloading the data set now is the time that you can actually load um, Load the, the data that has already been pre-generated for you So if you look at the the git repo that we made here, obviously here's where the ipython notebook is but there's also this um, NPZ file main basque 64 subsample features uh, This basically is the data we just generated. So um, as long as you have downloaded this whole repo um, this uh, data file should be existing in the same place as your IPython notebook. And by running this uh, function here, you should be able to load that data and you don't need to actually have the imaging data. So hopefully those of you that were not able to download the data, um, you now have this variable X features, which um, has everything we've done up to this point. And hopefully now you can follow along. Whoops. Uh, so X features, uh, let's look at the shape. Okay, here we are, 115 by 2016. Huh, does that make sense to everybody? So, um, yeah, so, so does anyone want to give me a, a guess as to what these two numbers are? Anybody? Even one of them, do you know like one of what one of these numbers represents? 155 su subjects and 2016 correlation coefficients. Yes, exactly. We have 155 subjects and we have 2016 correlation uh, uh, features, exactly, 2016 features. Now this is interesting because many of you might be thinking, well, we had a 64 by 64 matrix before, right? So we should have this many features. Uh, that's 4,096, so that uh, is not computing. Um, does anyone know why? Exactly, redundancy. Um, it's only, right, so it's almost only half, right? So if you did this divided by two, you're still not quite there. You actually have to do uh, this minus one because we don't want to count the diagonal twice, exactly the diagonal. So then when we do that, and we put our parentheses correctly, you get 2016. So now we have all of the non-redundant features in that correlation matrix. Um, so that's very useful. So now this is great because we have a subject by features matrix, 155 by 2016. And if you recall, this is exactly the structure of matrix that we want to start doing machine learning, subject by features. So we've now gone from having, you know, basically, a, a, I think a gigabyte of, of imaging data and compressed it into this simple matrix of relevant features that is simply 155 by 2016. And we did that relatively easily with just a few nylon commands. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so we've got our features. Um, we'll visualize our feature matrix now. And this is just what all the data we just generated looks like. Um, here are your features, here are your subjects. You might stare deeply into that and you know, imagine your future or whatever. You might also use this to see if there is maybe some issues with your data. Maybe you could find some missing data, or maybe you would see here that you have just one subject and it's all the same. Always a good idea to visualize your data, um, but it's a really cool idea to think about the fact that this is, um, you know, all of the data we're going to be inputting to your uh, machine learning model. 
And that looks exactly like this. So we've got this part of the model. We just need to now get our labels and we can start doing machine learning. So um, now we want to get y and assess its distribution. So um, I think I already imported pandas, so that was redundant, but um, our data uh, file that we download will have this path called phenotypic. Uh, oh, it's not a path, it's just an actual, um, well, it's not a data frame, but it's a, um, what are you? It's, an, it's a numby and array. So we are gonna convert it into a data frame so it's easier on the eyes. You guys should all know how to do that by now. And so here is the data for our, for our uh, data set. And quite frequently, or, or quite um, fortuitously, we have this column called age, and that's gonna be our target. So we'll, we'll just capture it in a, in a variable here. You guys all know, I guess by now, how to call uh, uh, a view of this age column. You just call, call the data frame, which we've called pheno, and um, type within square brackets uh, the name of the column, and that's y age. So uh, one of the most important things we have to do before we do any machine learning is we need to understand our data. We need to understand a little bit about this target. What's the distribution? Uh, you know, how old are our subjects in general? So probably a good idea to maybe plot a histogram or something. So that's exactly what we'll do. Um, you learned a lot about this stuff this morning with Pear. Uh, here I'm going to use Seaborn because I don't have to type as much and I'm lazy. And it's good to be lazy if you're a programmer. Um, so uh, I'm gonna use this distribution plot and I'm just gonna stick this variable we created called y age, which is the age of all, all of our participants. And here is our distribution. So this is a very realistic data set because that is not a normal distribution, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that is a fairly bimodal, I mean, I don't maybe even you could call it trimodal. We have a ton of individuals here who look like they're very young, maybe between two and four or five. Then you have another subset of individuals who are kind of between the five to 10 range, five to 12. And then you have this kind of separate distribution of, of adults that's a lot smaller. So this is very important information because if we're gonna do things like training sets and test sets or cross validation, we need to be aware of this because what if we end up training a model that has all children and try to test it on adults? It's not gonna work very well, right? So we need to kind of, uh, we, need to, we need to somehow account for this when we're doing our making our test sets and our training sets and so forth. Um, we're also going to have, I guess, some trouble with this if we're assuming linearity of the data because clearly our, our target is not linear at this point. Um, so we're preparing now the data for machine learning. Um, maybe this would be a good time to stop and uh, just take some questions, maybe take a short two or three minute break. If you have questions, ask them. If not, again, encourage you to stand up, stretch, Relax, we've got another hour, maybe hour plus of this. So just take a second to chill. When, you, uh, when we come back in two minutes, um, we'll, do the, we'll do the machine learning aspect of this. But up until this point, do we have any questions about what the data is, how we've loaded the data, um, or anything like that before we get into the machine learning? Please, now is a good time to ask those questions. And maybe while you post those questions, I'm gonna get some water. Thanks, Jake. Uh, I'm just uh, like maybe thinking of uh, resuming at uh, 15.35, like uh, 35 is okay, Jake? Resuming at uh, 3.35 is, uh, is too short or is it okay? That's fine, yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, let's take a real five minute break. Um, and uh, if, you, yeah, um, if you do have questions, uh, we will be monitoring the chat. In terms of assessing whether or not a linear model is the best to use, should we check the correlation between true and predicted y to determine if it produces a linear relationship? Yeah, for sure. So um, as, you'll, as you'll see in this next section, we'll, we'll basically go through a lot of examples um, that will include choosing different models, looking at the output, evaluating what's going on. But it is, so as the key here though, is that you're doing all this in your training set. You, you need to, at some point, take your test set and just leave it aside seal it in an envelope, you know, give it to your friend you trust, lock it in the safe, don't touch it. As long as you do that, um, you can take your training data and this, uh, your training data is really meant for this. It's for training. It's for as long as you're being careful about overfitting, which we'll talk about in detail, um, 
you, you will want to do a lot of evaluation. You train your model and you look at it, and you might say, hey, this model is not fitting this data. Um, the distribution isn't working. Maybe I should reevaluate and try a different model and you know, do some cross-validation to see if, it, if it's actually working on, on unseen data. And that's really what this evaluation and training is all about. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to some examples of that. If anyone else has some questions, do post them. I'll be back in 60 seconds. I think there's a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, okay. Uh, it's good. I had a I had a, a kind of like tangential question, so like uh, it's more important for the students to ask them. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll just there was a question earlier about data frames. Um, in that particular case, if you have multi-level data frames, you can you basically just have to wrangle the data such that uh, you can make correlation matrices out of it. But but uh, you can. Uh, it's fairly simple to use most of the functions you've seen here, whether you have an image or if you have already pre-existing data frames. Usually in that case, um, the job has already been done for you to, to make the time series or so forth, but you can still pass those time series to, uh, for example, the correlation uh, transformer measure. Sorry, JB, what, what were you gonna say? I was just wondering where, do you know where uh, Nylon is storing the data uh, physically? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Well, so if you if you ever want to know that, um, really one of the key things you can do, let's see, oops, uh, is you can ask where it is. So right, so we have um, func dot, um, I'm not, sorry, data dot func for example. Let's look at the first one. It will give you the path, which will show you exactly where your data is saved. So um, in this case, mine is in users Jake Vogel Nylern data. Um, this might or may not be a hidden uh, directory, but the, this is in your in my home directory on my Mac. Might be different from Windows, but the nice thing is you can um, basically paste this and see exactly uh, the path to where the data is living. So for those for those who have uh, like uh, we've put, they have downloaded the data. Maybe that's uh, something to just uh, uh, have a quick look. I mean, uh, there are a couple of people that have downloaded the data but didn't uh, seem to able to use them directly uh, from the notebook. So. Yeah, that's a little bit weird. I think part of the, um, part of the point of, of this uh, fetch um, development function, and all of the fetchers actually, is that uh, basically if you don't pass a data directory, it basically comes up with a default and that's the first place that it looks. So you can, if your data has been downloaded, you can pass the uh, that directory to data directory and that's where, where it will look uh, to load your data. So if it's already been downloaded and you're sure about it and you know where it is, you can put the path into this command and that's uh, where it will get loaded. Jacob, yes. just a quick note on that. Can, can you hear me? I can. Um, don't specify all the way to the 
fMRI, the development fMRI folder just to the Nylearn data folder. Oh, that's a great. If you, if you specify after that, like to the development fMRI folder, it'll start downloading it again. Okay, I assume, I assume that's Kendra based on your yeah. voice. Thank yeah. you, Kendra. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so what Kendra was saying was um, very great point. I think, I, I guess you only want to pass up to this part of um, the path to, to neither, not the entire path. Um, yeah, and not, not even the development fMRI part, just up to Nylearn data, yeah. Okay, so basically it wants to know where is, where is all, Nylearn storing all of its data. Yeah, where is all Thank of it. Thank you very much, Kendra, that's very helpful. Um, okay, one more question before we get back in. Just to clarify, this data is using correlations between brain regions across the entire 332 seconds session. For example, on average, how much region A was active and regions B was active in the total 32 seconds, even though they may not have been active at the same time, right? Yeah, so maybe not on average, but, but the idea was, you know, if you think about a time series as, you know, regions uh, up blood flow, down blood flow, up blood flow, down blood flow, um, same thing going on. In fact, I think I have an image of this earlier. Well, I don't feel like going all the way back, but yeah, so um, exactly. It's, it's how much that time series is correlated over time. So I, I guess in a sense, yes, you could say if these two regions throughout the time course are more or less seem to have the same dynamics in terms of blood flow, um, then they are more functionally connected. The less that the dynamics are the same, or if they're even perhaps opposites of one another, then they might be anti-correlated. But yeah, it seems like you, you've got a, a handle on what's going on. All right, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll get back into it now. Um, we want to be sure that our training and test sampler match, right? So uh, when we left, just to remind you, we had discovered that we have this weird distribution of our target age. So we want to kind of address that somehow, right? So we need to create our training sample and our validation or our test sample and leave that aside and not touch it. Um, so um, there's a, because we have this weird distribution of age, we want to somehow stratify uh, the cross validation so that it accounts for this weird distribution. And we want to make sure that our test set and our training set basically have the same distribu age distribution across them. Um, and this is true of any target. If your target is on your classes are unbalanced or your target is, is really distributed, you want to make sure that distribution is maintained between training and test. Um, I guess for, for obvious reasons, if that doesn't make sense, please let me know and I'll explain. Um, so we do have this variable called age group, um, which makes that uh, makes our lives much easier. You can see that there are, um, I'm using this really helpful value counts function that uh, exists for any given um, pandas series. So I've, I've basically uh, saved a view of pheno age group uh, as age class. And now because this is a pandas series, type of age class, pandas series, uh, it has this attribute called value counts. And you can call that and it will tell you how many values uh, there are for each of the, um, well, how many instances there are of each of these values. Um, and this is really helpful because um, it, it's, th these are fairly even uh, categorizations. So we can use this to stratify our um, training and test sets so that we have an equal number of five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, adults, and eight to 12-year-olds in both training and test. So now we're going to start to use uh, sklearn. So most of the stuff we're going to do now is going to go away from nylearn into sklearn, which is Python's kind of um, de facto uh, machine learning library for a very good reason. It is just a spectacular library. And I really learned much of what I learned of machine learning by really going through the documentation for sklearn that is available. So I, I really encourage you to do that if you want to understand things better along with other things like what you're doing now. Anyway, um, we're gonna use this very, very helpful train test split function, uh, which is um, part of sklearn. So we're from sklearn.models selection, we're gonna load this train test split function. So what this is gonna allow us to do is pass our features and our target, so x features, y age, and it will then um, let us get out basically a training version and a validation version or test version, whatever, uh, what have you, uh, of each of those. So in goes X features and Y age, out will come X train and Y train, as well as X val and Y val validation. So um, there's a, a bunch of different things that we can perturb here. 
uh, such as the size. So in this case, we want to, we're gonna choose a training set of about 60% of the data and leave 40% out to test. This is always an important distinction and question because on the one hand, you want to have as much data as you can in order to uh, train a better model, right? We, we know that uh, more data usually makes better models or more reliable models. At the same time, we want to make sure that we feel confident about our evaluation on the test set. If we have too few uh, data points, we don't, we don't feel that confident about um, you know, how well we've done at the end because maybe we're just not sampling enough of the true distribution. So uh, we're kind of, you know, the, the, there's a lot of debate as to how you should do this. We're doing a 60-40 split. We're also doing a very, very important thing and we're shuffling our data. Um, and there, I just saw a publication recently about what happens if you don't. Um, but a lot of times data will come in a way that it sort of not shuffled. Um, and this data actually isn't shuffled. It's actually um, the oldest to youngest, which is not good. We wanna shuffle that data. So we make sure that it's, we, we don't pre-specify by accident any um, features into the model. And we're shuffling, but, and we're also setting the random state. So we're making sure, I know that every time, as long as my random state is one, two, three, anytime I run this command, I'm going to get the exact same shuffling of the data. If I change this random state, it's gonna be a different shuffle. So this is important for reproducibility. Um, if you wanna change this, you can go ahead, so you'll get slightly different results, and you'll see that, you know, by changing this, you might get slightly different results. So it's very good to understand that there are some stochastic elements to everything we're doing here and that there is just literally an aspect of randomness about uh, to the results that you get, which is why it's very important to repeat a lot of these processes several times and to get a sort of interval of confidence. So we'll go over that at the end. Anyway, the last thing we're doing here is using this stratify argument and we're stratifying by age class. What, and I guess you know by now what we're doing is um, making sure that X train and Y train, uh, actually no, not train, the, we're shuffling the target. So X, uh, Y train and Y validation have the same distribution. How could this ratio be dependent on data, si data size? I'm assuming that you're uh, talking about the train test ratio. Um, if you have enough data, probably a 50-50 split is best. If you've got tons and tons of data, um, and you're confident that you have enough data to train, then maybe a 50-50 split would be best. Um, if you don't have a lot of data, well, yeah, what's a lot? There, are, as Stephanie said, there are ways to determine that. Um, probably what's a lot, in most cases that you run into in neuro, neuroimaging, you will never know because you will never have a lot of data. You will never have enough data to, to do the types of um, you know, estimates that we'd really, really want to do, like for example, predicting a disease. Um, but I can tell you right now, we do not have a lot of data here. We have 155 subjects. Um, so it's a good question. I have seen, there, there are multiple answers. I don't think that there's a wrong answer to this. I think it's better to just understand the differences between having enough data to train versus having enough data to be uh, confident about evaluation. What do I mean by the same shuffle each time? We're splitting only one time, I think. Yes, that's correct. But um, we are splitting the, splitting the data. If, if the data is in a single order and you split it, then you will get the same split every time. That's not good if, for example, your data is ordered. If I shuffle the data, different subjects will go into training and test. If I shuffle it again, different subjects will go into training and test. So we're only splitting once, but if I come back and run this notebook a week from now, and I'm getting different results, I will be very, sometimes very confused because maybe my result will go away, which is, you know, that's why you have to reinitialize this multiple times. But the idea is just for reproducibility, every time I run this notebook, I get the same results. Um, would it be wrong to try 60-40 split, 80-20 split, and cetera, and pick the better one? Yes, I would say you want to just stick with the best one because when you want to kind of mess around with different features, you are running into bias and the potential of hacking. This is not something, you can't cross validation, your, you can't cross validate your split. So there's no way of really evaluating this in an unbiased way. So you kind of just need to pick a split and go forward with it and you can't do anything after I would say. So um, if, I will tell you this though, if your split is making a big difference as to how well your model is doing, you don't have enough data to be doing machine learning. Uh, you really need more data. Um, what other random state values are there? Anything, what's your favorite number? Seven, 2,864, whatever, it doesn't matter. You can, this is just a seed for the random number generator. You can pass any integer. 
Yes, exactly. All right, moving on. So train test split. So once we run this, we're, I'm going to ask it to print the length, uh, the size of the X training data and the size of the X validation data, and it should be a 60-40 split. And sure enough, we now have a training data set of 93 individuals, a testing data set of 62. And now we want to make sure that our stratification um, performed well. Uh, great question. So here we have training. And is someone about to say something? So here we have training and validation data. Where is the test data? We'll get to that. Don't worry. Um, sometimes I, may, maybe I may have confused you with the terminology. Um, there is uh, sometimes people will call the validation set the test set, the test set, the validation set. The point is we are leaving out some data that we are just not going to touch until the end. Whether you want to call that the validation set or the test set is up to you. In an ideal world, um, uh, you would want a training set and a test set and a left out validation set. And I'll go into why a little bit later. Random state 123 produces same shuffle each time. What if we pick some other value? Then it will produce a different shuffle. Um, but it will be consistent. If you do 1,000 every time, it will do the same shuffle. If you do 1, 2, 3 every time, it'll do the same shuffle, but it will be different from 1,000. It's just a way of um, freezing the stochasticity in the sense of the random uh, whatever you're doing that's stochastic. OK, so we're visualizing the training and test sets to make sure that they are uh, they have the same distribution. So here is the uh, age of our training data and the ages, age distribution of our uh, test data. You can see. Jack, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm uh, jumping again on the on the uh, terminology aspect because I think that uh, may be confusing for some students. Uh, uh, Stephanie called the test sets the, the the data set that has been put away that you're not going to touch. Uh, and uh, and I think you're calling here the test sets what she called validation test uh, hmm. set. I think I just uh, I don't think there is one terminology in the in the literature. That's why everything is so confusing. But uh, you know, mentally at least, <laughs> remember that there is uh, one part of the data that we are not going to touch, uh, and uh, and they are not there. Uh, and uh, the, and this is uh, it is within the cross validation. Um, totally. Thank you for that clarification, JB. Yeah. So ho hopefully, hopefully that's clear. We will revisit this 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 topic several times to kind of get it uh, put into your mind. It'd be great um, to have a standard, but we don't have a standard. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, so as you can see here in orange, we have the test, uh, the distribution of the age in the test set. In blue, we have the training set. You can see these kernel des density plots are very highly overlapping. Um, so we did a pretty good job here ensuring that um, there is sort of an equality in the distribution of the training and the test set. So that's important. So that was just kind of like a, a sanity check. Okay, so it's time to run our first model, right? We've, we've done all this build up, let's, let's do some machine learning. All right, um, what did I say here? Sorry, I got, I got really, I got too hyped there. Um, <laughs> um, yes, right, we're gonna use a fairly standard regression model, um, support, support vector regressor, okay? So this is not deep learning, this is not a, Super nonlinear random forest. It's it's a standard um, machine learning regression uh, technique uh, that uses a L2 regularization. So we can use more sophisticated models later. But for now, we're just going to start with something pretty simple. Um, for this specific case, wouldn't it be better to have an equal number of observations over all classes? Yes, of course, that would be I I ideal. Um, yes. Okay. I understand that in doing that, we've reduced the number of observations. Um, but I think that way would induce artifacts in the model. That's a, that's a great point. So the, the, the idea is that, you know, let's just skim off the, the, the top so that we have an equal number of data points for every um, age class. So in this case, we really don't have a lot of data. And, um, you know, so this is something that you could try. You could take, as long as you're working in your training data, you could try that. You could try only selecting the data points um, that are, uh, so you, that you have equal footing across all of the age classes. There are actually functions in sklearn that will do that for you. And you can see if that improves your model. My sense is with this few subjects, it will not. You will have not enough data to train your model. Um, you're at least maybe better, at least you have one group that will be well um, kind of described, which is kind of your, your youngest group. And that's better than, than not. But I think it's a great question and it's something that you can experiment with. 
Um, support vector machine and support, so, so support vector regression, regression is a type of support vector machine, as is SVC. Uh, so they're, they're both support vector machines, it's just the regressor is using a similar strategy for a regression problem. Yes, okay. Um, right, so here we're getting to this part that Estep had, had described. We've got our um, X data, which is functional connectivity. We've got age, our target. We now want to find a function that maps X onto Y. Um, and we will uh, do that by minimizing the loss. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we're gonna do in the next step. I'm glad that Estep walked you through this because all of this is, a lot of this is really done for us uh, by SKLearn. So it's as simple as you know, importing the support vector regressor. And by now you should be used to this, um, this API where what we do is we don't just say SVR, you know, function SVR to the data. No, we, we, we first initialize this object uh, uh, SVR with some parameters. At this point, <laughs> there are many, many parameters uh, but at this point, and we'll go over that in a little bit, but we're just going to pass one thing, which is to make it a linear uh, model. We do not want a complex nonlinear model at this point. Remember, we said we're going to start simple. If we get too complex, especially with this little amount of data, we risk overfitting. We'll talk about that later. Um, so, it is, so first we initialize the object. Once we've initialized it, we will fit it. So just like the, the stats models, um, you know, linear, uh, ordinary least squares regress, regressor that JB showed us earlier. We are uh, basically initializing the model and then fitting it. We pass it our X and our Y and we are only using the training data, okay? So there we go. We have fit the data. It's now giving us some output, which is just listing the um, parameters. You can notice that here we put kernel as linear, so that's there. The rest are the defaults. This includes some hyperparameters as well as just some um, kind of things for maintenance. Like, yeah, we'll get into some of the hyperparameters later. Um, yeah, so that's it. You just trained a machine learning model. Okay, so the training, you know, the training in the training set is complete. That's as, that's as much as it takes. Um, so now we want to see how well that uh, data uh, fits, right? So now we, we want to look at um, the, what that, now that the, the estimator has um, been fit to the data, we want to see what it will predict. What does it predict uh, age will be? That's kind of this Y hat here. I know poor Steph is probably very upset that my formatting got messed up because she had some very nice slides, but it says test data. This should be Y hat, and this is sort of our predicted Y. So here's our actual age, here's our predicted age, and we will use some sort of loss function um, to, to basically tell us um, how, how well we've done for our prediction. So, um, you know, if this was like a general linear model, essentially what you're, you're doing is you're, you're taking your, your model that you just fit and you're applying it right, right back to your training data in a sense. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get through that in a second. So, uh, cause I want to illustrate a point here. So in order to get our predictions, it's very simple. We have now initialized this LSVR object and we have fit it. Now that we have fitted it, fitted it, uh, we, can, we can predict, we can use it to predict some data. So we can pass in, for example, the same training data that we use to train it. Um, not recommended, as you'll see, but, uh, but just for the sake of, of um, example, we'll do that. And we can also um, use this uh, function called score, where we're getting the score. In this case, I think in a linear model, it will default to the R square. I'll show you later how to get other metrics. For now, I just want to illustrate a point. So now we're getting uh, our accuracy and we're getting our prediction. Oops. So now we want to view our results. This is a very important part. You always want to look how, how you're doing. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to print the accuracy that we just uh, got. So, you know, we're going to, the big reveal in a sense. And I'm, going to, and I'm going to plot two things. I'm going to plot the actual uh, Y train, which is the actual observed age. And I'm going to plot, plot the predicted age that we just predicted by the model, okay? So that's, so then we can see how well, how well we're doing. R square of 99.9%, a perfect fit. Hmm. Well, so what should, what should, we, what should we think when we see this? Should, we'll say, holy crap, machine learning is amazing. We just used like 155 data points. We could predict age perfectly. <laughs> 
Right. So now we get the two types of answers that are great. One is let's publish in nature. Uh, and the second is suspicious. Suspicious is the correct answer. And I'm illustrating this because this is a very important thing. If you see this in your own data or in anyone else's data, you can rest assured that they made a mistake. They did something wrong because um, does anyone? Yeah. So I, I basically allude to that. Um, when you see this, something is wrong. So, so, so someone want to tell me what the problem is? Anyone who, who feels like they've got a grasp of this want to tell me why, why this is a problem? Uh, because you're testing on the same data set with training using the validated data set we have 50 errors. Well, someone's jumping ahead. Um, yes, we're predicting age with age. We can't evaluate on the training set. Yes, I think you guys got the point very clearly. So we're basically just saying, it's like saying memorize the ages of all these people and, um, and then I say, now tell me the ages of all these people, you can spit it back to me. But if the people, uh, if I get a new group of people, right? And you put the exact same ages in, is it going to work? You could think of this in terms of, let's say you're trying to uh, develop something uh, to identify whether someone has COVID-19. You know, you've got their blood, you've got a bunch of proteins, you have eight samples and you take all of their proteins and you fit a model and it's perfect. And you say, okay, great. These Proteins will exactly tell me if someone has COVID-19. Then you get another group of eight people. If you use the exact same parameters, if the model worked, then you should get a reasonable guess. Maybe you'll get here and there. Maybe there's another protein that you didn't, you know, that, that wasn't in your first sample that you're not accounting for. So it's not going to be perfect. Um, but maybe you just got eight random people that have nothing to do with each other. And if you really overfit your model too much, then, then your tests, uh, isn't going to work at all because you've basically overfit. I'll illustrate that a little bit further. So, um, right. So I, I think you guys, you guys got the idea. We only did the training. We did not actually do the test. So what we need to do is we need to actually have a left out test set. Uh, um, so we did, we did leave out our test set from before, but I, we don't want to touch that yet because we're still kind of playing around. There's two, two ways to, um, to address this. One is you could come up with another split, and I think that this is a, a good thing to do. Um, you can split your training data and have a test set, train on the training data, and then uh, basically use that to test against the unseen data. Another thing you could do is cross-validation. So we'll do both. And actually, ideally, you'll be doing both of those things at once. So here, I'm just going to quickly run through this. We're going to make a separate, um, a, another kind of uh, sort of validation set, if you will, to use Stephanie's um uh terminology so uh we're going to take our training set and split it into a second training set we're going to use kind of this time we'll use a 75 25 split we'll shuffle it same, same stuff as before stratify it and, and all that now we have a training set of 69 testing set of 24. Um, so we're going to now do the exact same thing but this time we're going to train uh so we've already trained on um no you know what i'm going to actually do something else. Let's retrain, let's refit our model. So I'm gonna come back and grab this code here. Um, right. Let's reinitialize our model. Okay. So here we're gonna reinitialize our model. We will now, um, uh, fit it to X train two and Y train two. Okay, so this is the smaller, uh, the smaller training set. Now we have a smaller uh, test set, which we're calling, I believe, X test. Let me just make sure I did that right. Yes, okay, cool. Train two and X test. All good, because everyone's called validation. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to train on our, our training set, and then we just left out 25% of the training set and call it the test set. So now we'll kind of fit the data on the training set and use it to predict the test set. And when we do that, you see, we get something that's a lot more realistic. Okay, there's a few things to take away from this. One, it's not perfect, so that's a good sign. It means that we didn't, um, we're not fitting and training, uh, training and evaluating on the same data. The second thing is, this is actually kind of impressive. We trained our, our data on this resting state functional data, and here you've got a sense of how well it's doing on data that the model did not see. Right? So it's applying the, the betas for each of these uh, connectivity um, 
uh, our values and applying this to this left out data and your mean absolute error here is th three. So basically you can, you can um, guess someone's age with an average error of about three years uh, just by using this, this um, training set of 75 people. So that's actually, yeah, it's actually, it's actually pretty, pretty impressive. This is because maybe this is an easy problem. Um, so machine learning can handle it pretty well. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so, but, but this is basically a, a success in a sense, but, but we, we can do a little bit better than this. And this is not giving us much flexibility to kind of tweak and perturb our model. And we're also reducing our training set. Um, you know, if you see point, our, our square of 0.7, maybe we can get even better than that. Maybe we can get 0.8 or something like that. So um, I wanna go through the idea of cross-validation, um, which is another strategy you can use to uh, evaluate on left out data. So, so as Stephanie already went through this, you guys should understand by now that we're taking our training set, we're separating it, uh, we're taking some of that data and using it as a validation set, and then training here, testing here, and then the next fold, we'll do the same thing, but we'll weave out some different data, train and test, and we'll use that um, to kind of evaluate our model before we do any testing. So in an ideal world, you'll do this, then you'll have a test set. And then even after that, you'll have a left out kind of validation set that you don't touch until the end. So we'll do some cross validation here. Um, and I wanna illustrate uh, an important thing here. Um, so what we're, we're gonna use this, this uh, sklearn function called cross val predict, and it's gonna do the cross validation for us. It's gonna take uh, as input, basically an estimator object, so a model, uh, as well as your training data, uh, X and Y, and then you can tell it how many um, uh, folds of cross-validation you want to do. Here we want to do 10-fold cross-validations. What this will do is it will train the data on 90%, test it on 10%, and for those tests, it will, it will, it will basically store um, the predicted values. Then it will take the next 10%, leave it out, train on 90%, predict the values, and store them. So then for, after each fold, we're storing more and more and more values, and at the end, we have um, predictions from, for all of the training data without actually using that data in the training. So um, this does all that for you. And I wanna point out here the fact that we can just pass this um, object L, uh, LSVR, which is basically our initialized um, estimator object. This is where you start to see why it's so amazing that sklearn has these objects. Because you can literally you know, uh, initialize an object, send all the parameters you want to it, and then send that object to another function altogether. And so, so it's really, really a cool, a cool feature. So we can pass our, our model to this cross-validation object and have it do the cross-validation for us. We'll also do, um, get the score of, of each one of those folds. And uh, we'll do it for two things. We'll do it for the R-square as well as the uh, mean absolute error. And you can see all I have to do there is change this variable scoring into one of the various um, options. Going back to the early lecture, what does it mean to repeat CV and several numbers of times? So ideally, you wouldn't do just one round of uh, cross-validation. Ideally, you would repeat the cross-validation many times. Um, that's ideally what you want to do, because what if you just kind of got lucky with the different... Um, in fact, I'll demonstrate it. So I've run this, I've run this um, cell. I've done the cross-validations. I've gotten the scores. And what I, what I want to do here is I want to show you the accuracy of prediction for each fold, okay? So um, that's all stored in this, um, app, in this MAE object, okay? And so I'm gonna go through this loop and for each of the 10 folds, I'm going to print uh, which fold it is, what the R square was, and what the mean absolute error is. And this is just on, let's say, so this is trained on 90%, tested on the 10%. And you can see there's a wide array of variation in uh, how well, uh, the cross, uh, how well the uh, model is training and, 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 and evaluating. You can see that sometimes it's really good, R square of 0.8, MAE below two. Sometimes it's terrible, it's uh, less than zero. So it's, it's basically not just chance levels, but it's worse than chance. It's like the opposite of chance, right? So there's a wide amount of variation. And so it's possible that just by doing some arbitrary split, you get better results. And that's why it's important to many times um, kind of uh, run, run through this process many times, basically. Um, 
So, but this is not how you would evaluate uh, the, the entire data set. You wouldn't just take the average of these accuracies, the average of these means. Instead, you would take all of the concatenated predicted values and compare those against the, the actual training data. And that's what we'll do here. Um, so here I'm calculating the R square score and the um, mean absolute error. Um, the question, what does negative accuracy means? It just means that in this case, so zero would basically be just um, no, just almost like no correlation at all, like flat. And negative in this case would actually mean it's, it's worse than chance. So ch if you just did it by chance, you would do better than, than this prediction. Um, yeah. So here what we're doing is negative R square. Yes, yes it is. But the R is a different value here. It's not, it's not calculated the same way. It's not like you get a negative R and you square it and somehow it's negative. It's, it's, it's a different um, calculation. Okay, so here what we have done is um, we have done, taken 90% uh, of the data and predicted it for 10%. And repeated that until we've done uh, 10 rounds of prediction. And then we have a prediction for all of the Y uh, uh, um, the entire training set without actually using the training data in the model. So once we have all of those uh, predictions, we can compare that to the actual observed data. So you'll notice that this seems to be doing a little bit worse than we did before. And actually, we have more subjects. We've got more um, uh, uh, sampling, better sampling. And so this is actually a better estimation of how we're, how we're doing in a sense. Um, so, and it's not as good. You can see that obviously there's a, there, the model does a good job separating adults from children, but other than that, it's not doing very well in this case. So, um, or at least it doesn't seem to be. So this is the type of thing that we want to look, we'd want to look and say, hey, maybe we can improve our model in some way. Um, some of the ways that Estef had talked about earlier, um, and maybe before we actually go and use it on the left out test data. Once we use it on the left out test data, we can't really go back and keep tweaking the model. Um, the reason is because let's imagine you train your data, uh, you think you're happy with it, you go and test it, you don't do so well. Then you're like, oh, okay, I need to, I need to do a new model. It's not working on left out data. Then you go back and then you tweak your model and you keep doing this until finally you get a data, you get a model that works really well with the left out data. And you're like, perfect, look at this. I've got data that predicts left out data. The problem is you're actually biasing your model fitting so that you're selecting a training data set that works for your test set. That basically defeats the purpose of a test set. What will probably happen is then someone else will come around with some data that wasn't in your initial training and your uh, model has been overfitted to your test set. So when you try it on some other test that you've actually never seen, it probably won't work as well or maybe at all. So that's why it's so important to do all of your perturbation in your test set. And if possible, or sorry, in your training set, and if possible, split your training set so you actually have a validation set in there. So then you train, 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 validate, and then you can see how you're doing. And then later on, once you're happy, then you can try it on the external test set. So it gets very complicated, but um, it's really important to understand. Um, okay, so, okay, we're doing okay. Um, oops, so the next section, I think we're gonna take some questions before that. I just wanna remind myself what's, best, what's next. Um, right, tweaking your model. So I think now's a good time to pause for questions. Does anyone have questions on, um, you know, fitting the model or cross-validation or um, training and test sets, anything like that, anything we've covered so far? Okay, looks like we're good. If some questions are coming through, go ahead and keep typing them and I'll answer them as they come. Um, so in order to not go too, too long, uh, I'll go a little bit quickly through some of these parts. I might skip some of them, but they are here in the Jupyter notebook for you to go through on your, on your own time. Um, but I do want to at least illustrate some concepts uh, and have a little bit of time at the end to talk about feature evaluation and so forth. Um, how is SVR different from linear regression? I never quite got the math. 
Yeah, so uh, I think one of the very important things is there is uh, a regularization that happens. There's, this is an L2 regularized uh, model. Um, so it is, it is penalized uh, in a way that linear regression is not. I believe that the linear regression is sort of like an L2 model, but with no penalty at all, with zero regularization in a sense. So it's similar, um, but there is uh, regularization that makes it different. Um, there are probably other differences that um, maybe uh, a staff or someone else uh, that knows the equate. Oh, look, a staff is just joining back in. That's amazing. She's psychic. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so if someone knows more details about the uh, how a linear um, regression is different than S SVR, um, feel free to answer in the chat. Um, but there's a lot of literature about this. But yeah, I think that regular regularization is is a major difference. Okay. So, um, right, tweaking your model. So as I said, I'll, I'll go through this somewhat quickly. Um, the, the idea here is that you're not satisfied with your model. You think maybe I didn't do something well with my model. Maybe I can change the hyperparameters or something else and make my model better suited for the data. In the end of the day, our data is our data and our data is really gonna determine most of how good our um, machine learning will, models will be. You've got bad data, there's nothing you can do to your machine learning models that will fix that. That's the first step. Then the next step is finding the model that best um, explains or approximates or um, reflects the data. Those are kind of the two biggest hurdles, finding good data, finding the models that work with your data. So that latter one here, the, the fitting of the machine learning model, that's pretty easy actually. So here we're gonna work a little bit about understanding your data and understanding your model. Um, so, yeah, I already went through this. You don't want to you don't want to touch the test data. You want to just do this using a validation set or a or, or using cross validation or both. Um, and it's very important to understand that you want to be very careful about tweaking your model, um, unless you know exactly what you're doing. It's very easy to overfit your data by tweaking, especially when you don't have a lot of subjects. You might do a bunch of tweaks, cross validate them and end up basically tweaking your model so that it really fits your validation set or fits your cross-validation, doesn't mean it's gonna perform better on your left out test set. Um, but there are some things that, that are important for evaluating your data and your model. So, um, right, so we've been over this idea of cross-validation. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll sort of do a tweak to our model and we'll look how it affects our cross-validated uh, evaluation. We'll try a few different things. I won't get to all of these, um, but I'll touch on some of them conceptually. So um, one thing to think about is our target, right? We've already talked about the fact that we're kind of fitting a linear model to somewhat nonlinear data because of our weird distribution. So one thing we can try is to uh, do somehow normalize our data. This is very common. Machine learning, uh, it's very common to normalize your data in some way, even in regular statistical models, you might z-score your data, um, standardize it in some way. Uh, you might make it so all of your data is between zero and one. There's all sorts of transformations that people do to their data so that it better fits the assumptions of, uh, of their model. <clears throat> and so that the data is scaled appropriately. Um, so here we will just, you know, we notice that we've got a weird distribution. So we'll try a log transformation. So I could just log transform the data using NumPy, but it's, it's a good idea to use a transformer object with sklearn. And the reason is, this is very important. Your transformation that you do in your training set, it, you can't do an independent transformation in your test set. You have to use the same transformation. If you z-score your data in your training set, you can't separately z-score your data in your test set. You, want, you have to basically normalize the transformation of your test data to the transformation in your training data or to your training data, um, or else you're gonna have problems. So it's not really relevant for a log transformation, but for the sake of um, the example, I will use, I will basically create a function transformer that basically just log transforms the data. So later on we can invert it and we can go back to our normal values or we can pass it to our test data, okay? So I'm basically just creating this, um, function transformer that will log transform our data. I am fitting it to our um, uh, age, basically. So this will get log age. Um, and then I will transform log age. I'm doing this separately because later on, I will want to take this data that's fitted to Y train 
and use it to transform Y test. So here I'm fitting it to train. I will use it to transform it to train, and later I will use it to transform it to Y test. Okay? And so now when we look at the data, it is still poorly distributed, but it's a little bit better. Um, not much better, but a little bit better. So let's see if that improves our model fit at all. Um, so we'll do some cross validation here, just like we did before. Uh, we will initialize our model. We will pass it basically the exact same stuff. We'll pass it the model. We'll pass it the training data. This is our cross validation. And this time, instead of passing it uh, age of the training data, we'll pass it the log of age of our training data that we just transformed. We will uh, make those predictions using cross validation. We will get the R square score. We will get the mean absolute error and we'll plot it. We'll do this all at once, okay? And by doing that, we see that this re results in, I would say, a, I think we can agree, a slightly improved model. You can see now, instead of just separating the, um, the old from the young subjects, there seems to be some, um, you know, uh, some age prediction within the young subjects here, in a sense. Um, so I've got some questions. Would you have to report in the article that you log transform? Absolutely. So really one of the most important things for all of us to do is to report everything that we've done. And there's no shame in it. There's nothing wrong with trying different things um, and getting different answers, some of which that don't help or that don't produce good models and some of which that do produce good models. There's many, many reasons why this is important. Publication bias is one of them. And also everyone tries lots of stuff. And when they don't report it, it slows down the entire field because then people start trying things that don't work. And also you get information as to why did this model work and this model didn't. That's, that's something that probably says something about the data that is useful for all of us to know. Um, we didn't quite get that. We should always transform the training data and then the test data separately using the same transform. Yes, yes. So um, yes. So if you want to normalize your training data, uh, later on, you need to use that same transformation to transform the test data. You don't want to independently transform the test data um, because the um, training data is training on a certain um, set of values. Let's say your z-scores go from negative two to two. And then in, uh, maybe that's, maybe that's, that's not a very uh, intuitive way to explain it. I guess the best way I can explain it is that you want to make sure that the when you're testing your model, you're really testing it in a way that is consistent with how you trained it. Um, so hope, hope, hopefully that's clear, but it sounds like you got it based on your, um, your comment. How does CrossVal predict combine the results from different cross-validation runs to give you a single predictive model? Um, right, so let's say we've got, um, you know, here is, let's say we've got um, fold one. We've got, um, you know, each one of these is, let's say 10 data points, 10, 10, 10, and 10. We leave out this 10, we train the model on this 30. We use this model to predict what's happening, uh, the age of these 10 subjects, and then we'll get 10 values, right? So, you know, maybe those are your 10 values, okay? That's not 10, you get the point. Then we have another fold, fold two. Here, we're doing, um, we're leaving out these three, uh, th we're, we're, we're training the data on these 30 and we're testing it on this left out 10, okay? So now you notice that for these guys, we are not using these data to predict these data. We are only using other data to predict this data and we'll get another set of 10 values, right? Okay, so then once we do all of that, we will have 40 predicted values at the end. And so those 40 predicted values, we can then compare to the original observed data. And the idea here is that for each of these predicted values, we never, we, we got to use 90% of the data, but we never used the same, we get never used data in the training to test it. Wow, that was really poorly put. Um, data that was predicted was predicted without being included in the training, but we still get to use all of the data in a sense. So it's like maximizing the amount of data you use while still getting out of sample predictions. And so we put that all together, we have um, 40 predictions that are out of sample and we can, we can um, compare that. 
it's not as good as doing a left out data set, but it's a way of approximating how your model um, tweaks have changed. Why do you use function transformer? Yeah, so I, uh, well, so just to say that again, um, you could do MP log in that case, that would actually make a lot of sense because that's not going to change. I did it in this case because if you did any other kind of transformation, like a min max or a z score or something more, more sophisticated, you could then store that transformation and later apply it to other data or invert it. You know, it's very easy to get back into um, your untransformed space. So with the log, it's not necessary. I'm just doing it for, for example. Okay, moving along. Um, so we seem to sort of improve our model by using the log of age. Okay, so that maybe that's important. Maybe we should be using log log of age um, in order to, uh, you know, do these predictions. Maybe maybe that's the best way to go forward. So um, I'm gonna maybe go very quickly through this these next few parts. Um, so tweaking hyperparameters. So many. Uh, as Stephanie explained to you what hyperparameters are. They're, they're parameters that are set essentially by humans. The machine does not do any simulations or optimization to get them. The human must make that choice or do that optimization themselves. So one way you can do that is using cross-validation. Um, so you could, for example, change, you know, one of those hyperparameters, do the cross-validation and see how well um, your new model with this tweaked hyperparameter uh, performs. Um, so if you can look at your SVR object, I can look at uh, its parameters by using the question mark. You can see it's got um, a few different hyperparameters. You can read about all that stuff here and on the documentation, but specifically it's got this, um, um, where is it, C, which is the main hyperparameter, and it also has uh, epsilon as well. Um, and there are other, some, some other features as well. So uh, maybe you want to, um, you know, tweak C and see how changes to C change your model. Um, so, oops, I did not mean to do that. There we go. Um, so we can do that with a val what's called a validation curve, which is basically you look at model performance across various um, hyperparameters or parameters, essentially. Uh, so I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, you know, if you want more detail, I would, I would uh, encourage you to go on SKLearn's documentation and read about validation curves. They have a lot of um, excellent examples. Uh, but really what we're, what we're doing here is just like before, we're passing the model, the training data, um, both X and Y, and we're still using the log here. We are telling it one of the parameters uh, inside of this model, right? It was called C, and we're literally passing the name of the argument, which is C. We will then pass a range of, of potential values for C, okay? And just, I'll, I'll run this real quick and so you can see the values that I've passed. Um, you can see that there are values that go from 0 0.0003 or 01 to all the way to, uh, man, I'm so bad with scientific notation. There you go. Here are the values that we're going to pass to C, okay? So um, we're gonna pass all of those values to, to, to C and basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna do cross-validation uh, for each of the values in C range. So it's gonna change. So basically you're doing all of the possibilities at once. And as long as you're sticking in your training set, you're, you're theoretically okay. So we did that. It takes a while because it's doing several rounds of cross-validation and um, I'm going to skip this because then I'm going to um, make uh, wrangle the data into a into a, a fashion that is useful for plotting, and then we'll plot it. And so, what you can see here is here are the various values for C, and here is the um, training accuracy. And we're using and I'll explain. Uh, and the y-axis is the score. The score is is negative mean squared error. The reason I chose that is because that is the loss function that the model is using for optimization. So I, I want to be um, true to the model and use the same loss function that it's using. So uh, lower is, is, is or I'm sorry, higher is better in this case. You want values closer to zero. So um, you can see that as these values in C change, um, the pr prediction accuracy gets better both in the training and the validation set. 
uh, yes, the y-axis is the um, is the uh, basically our evaluation of the model. So you can think of it like r square or the mean absolute error. In this case, it is the the negative mean squared error. MSE. It's this. It's the MSE. So the mean squared error. It's basically what the SVR is using as its loss function. It's using it for optimization. So it's, but, but it's basically just a measure of model um, evaluation to see how the amount of error. Um, so you can see across the different um, cross, uh, cross the range of cross validation, you can see the the variation. And one really obvious thing that jumps out is the training data does incredibly well, um, and the validation data does way worse. That's something that we already saw. It still isn't doing bad, but it's something that we've already saw and we know this, and it's good to just see that reproduced here. But interestingly, we kind of saw the same pattern in the training data and the um, validation uh, data, which is that um, basically the model does better as you get higher values to see until around maybe 0.01, and then it levels off. So I think it's fair to state that the default value, which was one, uh, is fine, and we're not going to do any any better by changing that. But this is just a good way to to tune your hyperparameters. You do want to be careful about overfitting here. You really want to if you really want to see a difference that is obvious and um, consistent. Um, I'm going to skip this next part, which talks about if you have multiple hyperparameters, you can use a grid search. I'm not going to go into that, but grid search just lets you do the same thing but evaluate um, many parameters at once. So we're going to skip that for now. Um, trying a more complicated model, uh, I, I want to just illustrate this point. So I'm not going to go into the details of exactly of how I do this, but I want to just illustrate one of the points that Stephanie made earlier about how model complexity isn't always a good thing. So what we're going to do here, um, grid search is evil. I heard grid search is evil. Do you share this opinion? At this point, I would say. Yes. Um, evil might not be the right word, but the problem with grid search is it basically is, you're, al you're almost guaranteed to overfit in a sense because there are multiple parameters that might, like, like let's just look at the example we saw before. Here you can see that, um, la, 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 la. Oh, so much text. Don't put text on your slides. Anyway, as you can see here, um, all of these values of C basically gave you the same answer. But a grid search would, would do all these evaluations and arbitrarily might say this one, 0.01, is objectively better than these. Really, that's not true. They're, they're not, it's not significantly different. They're all the same. And the grid search could really return any of these values um, except for this one. And you know, it's, it wouldn't really be true. All of these are essentially the same. So. Um, it's, the grid search is designed to help you pick your parameters, but if you're not really evaluating every single one of the possible options, you aren't, you might just be overfitting to your training set. So I would generally stay away, um, from a grid search, uh, in general, unless you have like an enormous data set and you're very confident that your training data is effectively and perfectly, um, sampling your population, which is not very common. So I'm going to sk skip the grid search stuff, but that's a great question. Um, right, and so we're trying a more complicated model. So here we're just going to fit models with increasing polynomial fits. Maybe you'll say, oh, age is uh, you know, a quadratic function. Well, we'll test a quadratic function as well as a third, fourth, up to eighth order pol polynomial using a validation curve. Again, I'm not going to have time to go through exactly how I do this. Um, but it's just by using um, a validation curve, you can obviously go back to the code yourself and have a look um, and also read the, the sklearn documentation. But I want to show you a really uh, in interesting point here. So what I'm showing you here on the y-axis, once again, it's the same thing it was before. It's your mean squared error. H higher values approaching zero are better. Um, and on the x-axis, you have the polynomial degree. So here's a linear uh, model. Here is a quadratic model, and now we're going all the way up to more complex models. Um, here's a, seven, a, a polynomial of seven, or whatever you call that um, model. So interestingly, in the training data, you can see um, that, well, it's actually not very well demonstrated here because the training is always, always does really good, but it basically is showing you that you're doing better 
as you get more complex models. And that is, oh, that's pretty much always gonna be true in, data, in training data. More complicated models can better fit um, you know, weird distributions. The problem is that weird distributions don't replicate. Um, if you have a weird distribution, that means uh, the, the model basically doesn't have, it, um, will not generalize well. So you can see uh, that demonstrated very well here where as you increase the complexity of the model, actually the fit of the model goes, gets worse. It's, uh, it's the opposite of what you're seeing um, in the training set. And that's a good um, sort of um, demonstration of this sort of bias variance trade-off, right? So as we bias our model more and more to our training set, at some point we'll pass the threshold where we're overfitting and that model will stop being generalizable to, um, to other data sets, basically. It will be overfit. Um, Obviously, we don't want to be too basic. If we just fit a, a straight line to the data, well, yeah, it's unbiased. <laughs> it would probably do the same thing for all data, which is not be very helpful, but at least it's consistent. So the idea here is we want to find the kind of optimal point. Um, all right, so we are running low on time. So I'm going to just jump ahead a bit. If you have more questions, save them to the very end. Um, I'm going to skip this part about feature extraction. Um, so. You can read more about that later on your own. Um, and I'm just going to jump to, yeah, the really important part. So let's say we've done all the stuff that we're doing um, and you know, we're satisfied with our model. We think you know, adding all these tweaks, the log age thing, that's gonna help. All these other tweaks, we're just overfitting. You know, we've got this solid model. It's, it's basic, it's linear, it's on, unbiased, um, let's, let's just go forward with that in the log age. We're happy with our model, we're ready to unseal the envelope and look at our left out data, okay? So now, um, I think that by now you might understand how this would work. Um, you would basically, first you would, uh, if you were doing some sort of transformation, you would now apply that transformation to the left out data. That's why we earlier on saved this transformer object. Again, in the case of a log transform, it doesn't matter, but if it was some other kind of transformation, this would be a very important step. So we are now um, applying our transformation to the test data. Okay, so now we're really nervous because you know, once, once you know, we've, we picked our models, so we're just going forward and this is the kind of the, 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 the moment, the drum roll moment. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna fit the data um, to our training set. If we, are, if we had picked some parameters before, we could fit um, the model exactly as we picked before, but as we saw before, our default parameters were fine. So we're gonna leave the default parameters. We're gonna fit it to all of the data so we have the maximum amount, amount of data. And then we're gonna use it to, so um, here's training X, training Y. And for the first time, we are gonna use it to predict X val, which we left out way in the beginning of this module. So we will get the prediction, we'll get the score, we'll get the error all at once. We're really nervous. We're gonna plot it. We're just gonna like just do it all at once, okay? So here is where we get to see if your resting state data using an SVR can predict the age or the log age of left out mm -hmm. subjects. And here are the results. Actually, it does pretty damn good. Our score of 0.7, you're explaining 70% of the variance in age with this data. Mean absolute error of 0.25, go to nature. <laughs> there have already been some publications predicting age above 0.9, I think. So we're a little bit behind the curve here, but they had a lot more data than we did and much more complex models. Um, but, but this is a really interesting point because you know what? We did, not, um, we did not specially pick this data set because it would work. Uh, when, so Galvaroco and I made this, uh, um, this notebook a long time, well, uh, a year or two ago. And we just basically were looking for any data set on open neuro. We grabbed this data set, we kind of did things in the correct way, and this is what happened. So, you know, this was not a specifically crafted example. This is a real life example of data that someone put out on the internet um, into open neuro that we downloaded and used the fMRI data they had to predict the age of their samples. Um, so it's just a showcase that, you know, um, machine learning can be helpful in, in, in especially, we don't have very many subjects, but this is an easy problem. Um, so this is a, a good demonstration of that. Um, and while we're on the subject, I'd like to point out that uh, when we were making this data set for Nylon um, for um, BrainHack School 2019, Elizabeth, 
uh, who presented earlier in the week suggested, hey, let's, tell, let's ask the Nylon guys to use this as a um, example data set on Nylon. And the reason that it's on Nylon now is because um, you know, Elizabeth took that initiative. We had a Nylon uh, sprint, coding sprint at some point last year where we added this data set to Nylon. So the reason that this data set is on Nylon is actually because of BrainHack School. So that's a pretty cool uh, factoid about BrainHack School. Anyway, um, we're really running short on time. So I want to just go to the last part, um, which is uh, talk a little bit about features, uh, interpreting model feature importances. So the short answer to this is don't. Um, I, Stephanie, I think, went through this very well, where she explained that the point of what you're doing is not to understand the biology here. You can't really use this information. Um, that's a great question, Isabel. I'm going to answer it at the end, OK? Um, so yeah, so we are going, uh, you can't use this information to find out which connections are important in aging, unfortunately, um, because of the reasons that Stephanie pointed out. The machine learning models, they are not interested in that. All they care about is tweaking, moving these numbers around until we optimize prediction. That's all that, they, that, that, that is going into that. So um, <clears throat> you really can't interpret them. However, there are some times where you might want to look at what the model is doing because Oftentimes, I have found that there is some sort of confound that might be driving what's going on. Um, and it might just get it be a good to get a sense of what your model is doing. It's, I always tell people it's very, very good to visualize everything you can to understand what your model is doing. Um, maybe your model is using you know, areas outside of the brain to make its predictions. Well, then that's not very helpful. So um, right, I just went through this. So I just want to quickly show you a few. Really, the point of this is to demonstrate some really cool Nylon tools, to be honest. But, being that as it may, so we're going to look at the features of the model, okay? We're going to look uh, at, at the connectivity features. So um, the, this was an L2 regularization, so we will have many, many features, but many of them will be very small. So um, we can access the, the uh, weights of the model. It shouldn't say feature importances, actually. This is really just uh, beta coefficients. Um, yeah, we can, we can uh, access the weights of the model. Um, they are actually inside of the object that we just trained, um, inside this COF. Um, and you can see that, um, let's plot them so we can kind of see them better, right? So I'm going to plot these. I'm going to basically make a bar chart so we can see the beta coefficient for every one of the 2016 features. You can see that some features are, um, the beta coefficients are very high or very low for a lot of them. Um, they're kind of more towards zero because they're, you know, not important for the prediction. So, um, but that's kind of like, oh, well, I don't know what feature 250 is. So let's kind of get this into a more interpretable fashion. Um, so maybe we can look at the matrix we saw earlier so that we can see, uh, basically put, put the betas back onto the correlation matrix so we can see which connections are the ones that are stronger. So this function is actually not going to work for those of you that did not, um, initialize the correlation measure earlier on because you didn't have the data. So for this, the next, the, the thing is almost over, but you'll just have to watch for the next like three cells. Sorry about that. Um, so earlier we had this correlation measure, which basically made a correlation matrix out of a vector. We can now inverse, invert that transform. Oh God. We can now invert that transformation so that the, the, um, to go back from a core, um, yeah, exactly from a correlation matrix back to a vector, from a vector to a correlation matrix. The point is it's gonna be exactly the same as it was when we input the data um, from vector format to, uh, co to like a correlation matrix. Um, so when we do that, so then we can do this inverse transformation where we take this beta coefficient, um, make it, uh, I'm sorry, this, this vector of betas, that's 2016 um, values, and put it back into uh, a, a basically 64 by 64 matrix. That's all we're doing with this line. And then we plot it just like we did before. And what you see here is the relative betas of each connection. Notice here we only see the lower triangle. That's because I told this plotting matrix, hey, I just want to see the lower triangle. Um, so yeah, so now you can say, OK, well, you know, region 60 and region eight, those connections, those were important for the model. Okay, maybe that's, maybe you're satisfied there, but maybe you want to see it on a brain, that maybe that would be more intuitive for you. Um, so 
what we can do is we can use a couple of nonlinear functions for that. So basically, we, this is really amazing. We first need to find the coordinates of each region of interest in the atlas that we passed before, right? Now it's not going to know exactly what to do. It needs to know where are, where's the center of mass of each region. And that's what this function does, find parcellation cut coordinates. It's great. You pass it in the atlas, it will return the XYZ coordinates or MNI coordinates or whatever of each region, which is really, really helpful. So now we're doing that and it will return the coordinates. And finally, we just pass that to this um, plot connectome function, which is in Nyler. So what we're passing here is um, the feature ex explanation matrix, which is just um, that exactly the same thing you saw earlier, which is the lower triangle. We're passing it the coordinates and we're telling it we want a color bar. That's all we're doing. Now, this is going to take a while because it is now plotting um, 2016 connections onto the brain. And maybe before you even see what, uh, what it results in, you're going to notice that that's probably not very helpful. Actually, in the very beginning of this type of visualization, you would see this in papers all the time. Stuff that looks like this. Yes, it looks really cool. You're plotting every the betas of every connection onto a brain. But we like to call this a hairball plot because really what it looks like is a hairball coughed up by a cat. It's not helpful. It doesn't tell us anything. Um, but it's kind of cool that you can do it. Um, does this only work for human brains? My sense is no. Uh, my sense is that you can pass a, probably pass a background image that is different from the one you see here, but effectively all it takes is coordinates. Um, so it can, it can put those coordinates anywhere. I will have to look into the documentation to see if you can pass a different background image. Um, but I wanna show you something else really quick before we end up and ask questions. Um, so right here we decided, you know, this is, this is too, this is too many features. Let's just, let's just threshold it so we see the top features. So all we're going to do here is change the edge threshold um, so that it only takes the, uh, the, the, the highest positive and lowest negative features. And now we can see a little bit more clearly um, what's going on. Uh, so these are the kind of the top features. You can see they're all positive. So this was kind of really, really, really cool when we first discovered it. Now there is an even better tool in Nylearn called View Connectome because it's still a little bit hard to see what's going on there. So same um, arguments are getting passed. Here we can, we, there's lots of ways to threshold. We'll just pass, so we only see the top 98% of, of um, beta coefficients. And what this does is it plots a um, interactive plot into our notebook viewer, which lets us uh, actually move the brain around and, um, and, and look at where all, all the connections are. And, and now there's, there's no issues with perspective. Um, and so by the way, for the people asking, does this only work on a, um, on a brain background? You can see that um, some of the coordinates that I have passed are in the cerebellum, which is outside of this brain. And you can see that sure enough, they are being plotted here. Um, and even though there is no brain uh, render. I'm not sure if you can pass a different render instead of this brain. I'm looking through the arguments now. Um, that's the color map. Maybe not at the time, but you know what? If you're interested in doing that, you might um, open an issue on Nylearn or maybe even consider contributing to Nylearn. And I think next week Nylearn is having a big conference um, and some of that we'll talk about uh, develop, uh, how to develop for Nylearn that I think uh, you might be interested in. So I will post a link on Slack at some point. We're now drawing uh, late in the day. So that is the end. And uh, now is a good time for you to ask any more questions before we wrap up the session. So if you have any questions on anything we've done so far, including those uh, that have already been asked, now would be a good time. Sorry, JP, are you going to say something? No, just uh, joining you for the question and answer session uh, and uh, also wanting to thank you for the uh, superb presentation today uh, uh, very much. Uh, but let's, uh, let's take uh, some questions before we uh, wrap up the day. All right, well, I'll start with Isabel's question. Oh, I guess JB, you answered that. Um, you, the model you developed is extraordinary. You can now then apply it to any new data set and show the same. Group. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the idea. Um, and that's actually a really important next step. Sadly, you know, you have your own data set, you've done things well, you've had a left out set, and you do everything perfectly, right? You follow all the rules. 
it's still really important to now find another data set and validate on there. Because what if your results were actually de dependent on your, uh, your scanner manufacturer or um, the specific sequence of your fMRI um, paradigm or, or something else? You know, the, it, it turns out that you might be biased to your own data set. So it's crucial, even if you have great results like we do now, to then take another data set or as many data sets as you can find, maybe even train a model that's on multiple data sets and leave a test set out that's multiple data sets and try to actually validate um, your model because chances are, even if it works really well in your data set, it might not work that well in the wild as we've actually unfortunately seen in the field. Yeah. And in, in the field, it's called uh, uh, transfer learning or like, a, and, and basically the whole thing is the, uh, you know, how well, is something learned on some data set that has some specific distributions, multivariate distribution, how well is that uh, going to be uh, working for like uh, other distributions? And that's a, like a, that's a tough problem. Having like a, a robustness of the methods on, the, uh, on, on, on this is, uh, is, uh, is, is an active uh, actually uh, field of research uh, for those interested. The approach of splitting the data into training and test set be useful for evaluating Traditional statistical models. I imagine that a model with predictive value could be considered generally more valid. My answer would be absolutely. I mean, I think that you know you have to you have to understand what you're doing when you fit a statistical model. Um, you know, if you, for example, I see a lot in the literature, people will say that you know they fit the model and APOE predicts, you know, I don't know hippocampal volume. That was the example we saw earlier. And really, that's not what you're showing. You just showed that you you can fit a model that fits in your data, but without showing that it validates, you can't say anything about prediction. You can say that I built a model, and in this model, APOE was important um, and seemed to be important, but you can't say anything about whether that model will generalize unless you do some sort of validation. And it, Ahead, so we have, we have a question still on the, um, any precaution we should take in doing this transfer from Isabel? Um, do you want to take that, uh, Jack? Uh, sure, and then maybe you could follow up if I, if I don't cover yep. everything. Um, precautions you should take in doing transfers. Uh, so I think it's very important to remember that, you know, when you're training your model, your model is really fit to your data. So you want to do is if you want to bring in a separate data set, you really want to do as much as you can to make sure that that data set is, um, well, as similar, the more similar it is to your data set, the more likely it is that your model will work. But the truth is that in the wild, there's going to be many types of sequences, many types of scanners. The least that you can do is make sure that any tr transformations you have done mm -hmm. before your model, um, such as the log transform or the z corner or so forth, is done in the same fashion in this new data set that you're bringing in. I think yeah. that's really the most important thing. Yeah, uh, exactly right, uh, Jake. And, and so then in, uh, in like in more technical terms, what you, what you really want to do is uh, having some distance between the distributions of your, the data on which you have trained the, uh, the machine and the data on which you're going to apply it on. And that's not an easy task when uh, those data are very much multivariate and when, when, they, when the dimension of those data are, are, is, is high. Uh, so that's, uh, it's also like, you know, how to do that properly and, you know, and also how to assess the sensitivity of the departure of those distribution uh, is, is, uh, is again, I think uh, still a, a research area uh, of interest. Um, uh, yeah, but that's exactly right. So, and, and you also possibly, if you really want just to apply something to predict something in the world, you probably want on this the specific distribution or data set to have like you know, some ways of validating how well the model is performing, as uh, as you had in, on the uh, on the initial data set. Totally, completely agree. Uh, some really good questions being asked. Um, Kendra asked, uh, so what if you try something and then realize that it didn't make sense to try that, but you hadn't realized it because you're still learning? Should you report what you did? So. A few, a few answers to this. Um, so first of all, I think one of the really great things about you know, not only SKLearn is that they provide these sandbox data sets for you to use for learning. Um, uh, and a lot of them actually have been used previously by many other groups like the IRIS data sets. You can kind of um, have, these data sets are very, very well um, uh, described. So if you're learning, it's best to not learn on your kind of data that you wanna really do your machine learning on if possible. Um, 
but I think that in the end, the answer is yes. Uh, I think that, you know, recently I was, I was helping a student with a project um, and, you know, she tried uh, some different things and what we ended up doing, and I think that this is a good thing to do in general is, you know, if you tried multiple different models and you got different answers, I think it's great to report that because in the end, we're not trying to hide things. We're not trying to um, only reveal the things that are, that are, make us look good. What we're trying to do is advance science. We're trying to save time for other researchers. We're trying to understand the data, not just produce good results. So I think, you know, what's really, that's why supplementary information exists. You can put all this supplementary information of what you did before and refer to it with a simple line in your text and say, you know, earlier on we did this. And then it's up for the reviewers to decide if, if you've introduced bias uh, to your data. But I think it's, you know, transparency is fine and it's not shameful. It's just, it's the truth. And the you know, the more truthful we, we are, I think the better um, science will advance. I think this is, this is really a key thing that's on, on you guys and on us that hasn't always been done um, rigorously in the past. So it's kind of up to us to, to change that. Um, thank you, Danielle. I want to ask how you generally decide on the transformations. Is this something you might use cross-validation for? Is it rather domain-specific conventions? I would say that's a great question. I would say both. Um, I think that there are domain-specific conventions that are worth paying attention to. You definitely want to read the literature and see what other people are doing and understand why they're doing that. Um, I also think that your training data gives you an opportunity to experiment a little bit and and understand what transformations make sense for your particular case, um, as long as you're not um, seriously overfitting. Um, but I think I think the answer is really really both. And again, uh, on the idea of transparency, it's often good to try. You know, here we did the did the did the results with transformation and without transformation. Here were the respective results, and so people can understand the impact of that transformation on how well the data was fitted. Why are you reading maybe another question or two? Uh, I just want to go back to this uh, transfer uh, aspect because uh, it's, it's also known in the field as a uh, fairness. And you may have heard of uh, like a, a very spectacularly uh, dangerous example of a machine being learning on a bias uh, data set uh, that will then, you know, you'll be used for predicting some like, a, you know, whether you're likely to do some, uh, you know, like a crime or like something like that. And that's a, that's a very, very, uh, you know, like a, the, the, the bias in the data set that you had uh, was, would be basing those machines and, uh, and, uh, and not working, uh, you know, properly. And uh, so there's, there's a whole literature and, and field, which is called fairness uh, in, in this respect to see and, and, and control those biases. Uh, and uh, and it's, it also points to the, to the importance of reporting Exactly, not only the, all the transformation of the data, but you know, making sure that the data themselves are known, uh, you know, and, and uh, the, the, that machine that you've constructed is entirely depending on the data you, you've been using, uh, both for like a train, of, um, basically for tra tra the training, the training data, all the training data. Uh, that's a, the, that machine is a function of the, of those data. So the the origin and the and the distribution and all those things that is uh, happening in those data. That's that's what is uh, critical. I think that can't be emphasized enough. I mean, I remember seeing someone had this model for Alzheimer's disease where they, you know, if you put in your, your age and, and sex and APOE and something else, it would predict kind of your um, time to conversion or something like that. And, you know, they, they took the results of their model and put it on a website where people can enter their age and sex and so forth and get a response. And that is extremely irresponsible because this model has not been validated. But people don't know that. People don't... Yeah. Um, you know, under, understand how this stuff works and they might be given false information because from a, a biased model, essentially. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, and, and like uh, we're living in a society which uh, is going to use more and more machine learning and uh, AI for in, in many ways. So like uh, uh, knowing and, and, and being aware of the potential bias of those, uh, those things is, uh, is, uh, is critically important.